Hi, welcome back to the Personality Hacker Podcast. My name is Joel Mark Witt. And I'm Antonia Dodge. In a moment, we're going to dive into an interview with Tanya, who identifies as an ISTJ personality type. A few things to keep in mind before we get started. First, we may use some shorthand and technical language in this interview. So if you want to download a handy guide that will help you visually follow along, visit personalityhacker.com and find that PDF directly below this episode. Second, Tanya has been through our profiler training program, so she knows herself and type very well. With this in mind, we want to encourage you to look past any stereotypes you may have for the ISTJ personality. If you're brand new to type, I stands for introvert, S stands for sensor, T stands for thinker, J stands for judger. These four letters are called dichotomies, and they're what most people know about personality type. But the true power of the system comes from understanding personality on a much deeper level. And these are called the cognitive functions. In this interview, we'll dive into these deeper waters. To get an overview of the ISTJ function, search our podcast titled ISTJ Personality Type Advice. The cognitive functions can sometimes be a bit technical at times, so I recommend downloading our handy ISTJ guide directly below this episode. Again, visit personalityhacker.com to download that PDF. Today, we have a special guest, Tanya LaCourse, on the program. Tanya, welcome to Personality Hacker. Thank you so much. I feel very honored to be here. I'm a super fan and I've been listening for seven years. So oh, wow. thank you for inviting me. Awesome. Wow. <laughs> you, and well, thank you for listening so long. You also uh, have come through our profile training program and we've gotten to know you personally and uh, in that program. It's cool to have you here today because you identify your best fit type as an ISTJ in the Myers-Briggs system. And what mm -hmm. we thought we could do today is talk a little bit about what is that like what is it like to be an ISTJ? What are some things that you've gone through in your type journey and discovery, maybe some personal growth things? And let's see where the conversation goes from there. Uh, how did you how did you stumble into, upon type to begin with? Gosh, I think that I worked with a career counselor probably in 2004. And she administered the Myers-Briggs personality type test to me because I was really struggling. I was in a job that was very unsatisfying. And so she was trying to help me, you know, sort of make a different a change and sort of do, do a different direction. And um, I tested at that time as an INTJ. And that's that was really the kickoff for me um, to sort of start reading about it and um, and it's been a journey. So obviously I, I'm an ISTJ, not an INTJ. It's been, you know, it was a 10 year journey to actually get to ISTJ. Oh, wow. um, I, I, you know, kind of gobbled up lots of information I found online and um, kept taking, you know, just the free tests um, online. And I always, 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 always tested as an INTJ. You know, there, there are some cognitive functions that overlap with ISTJ. So extroverted um, thinking being the second function, which, you know, that really resonates with me and obviously as an INTJ. So I kind of, that part, I was like, that's, you know, that feels right. Um, and the introverted feeling part, but it didn't quite feel right to me. Like it was, it was, it was off. I was like, you know, pieces, I feel right. Um, so anyway, it was a 10 year journey, basically. Um, my brother got really into personality type sort of after I introduced him. And then it was actually, he, for the first time said to me, probably only like three years ago, dude, you're an ISTJ. <laughs> and so then I started sort of delving more into ISTJ and that, that definitely feels like my right fit type. Okay, so originally you tested out as an INTJ and you identified, what I hear you say is that you identified with the type enough to satisfy you, you know, like, like okay, this feels right, this feels kind of good. And then not that long ago, considering you've been familiar with type since 2004, not that long ago, your brother suggests maybe you're actually not an INTJ, maybe you're an ISTJ. Uh -huh. You read up on that and then you're like, okay, this ticks all the boxes. Yeah, for sure. And, you know, I, I had, um, you know, a bias, I would say toward ISTJ <laughs> because what you, what you read online is very, there's not a lot of depth, you know, and breadth, um, to that particular personality type. And so, 
my understanding was that they like can't stand change, that they like to do things the way that they do things over and over again. And they always, you know, go to the same restaurant and they're not adventurous and they, um, they're very boring, you know, is the word that you read all the time. And, and like, I am not those things. <laughs> so I've moved all over the country. I always am, I'm trying new things. And, and so that's, that's why I was really resistant to that type, but learning more about it. And, and really, you know, I didn't start learning about the cognitive functions. I mean, I listened to your podcast for a long time, but really taking your class, your profiler training class and and doing sort of a deeper dive and sort of going to your five-day workshop, like that has all helped to get a deeper understanding of the cognitive functions and the layers and the subtleties sort of within, you know, within each of the functions. So, so that's really cleared it up for me. (laughs) So, uh, yeah. So there's these descriptions, these kind of type descriptions of ISTJs out there. And even if you had earlier on suspected you were this type, those descriptions would not have resonated with you. And it's not until you understood functions that it was like, okay, now I get what's going on. Mm -hmm. Yeah, exactly. And I'm part of this ISTJ Facebook group, and I, I don't remember the name, and I'm very, like, I very loosely sort of read the post. But even in that, which is supposedly, you know, all of these personality type people and, and ISTJ specifically, like there's a lot of misinformation floating around and you sort of, you hear those like stereotypes, like over and over again, like, for example, some will say like, what's, what's a great job for an ISTJ? And people will respond, anything boring and tedious. (laughs) (laughs) And they're self-identifying with that. That's interesting. And and I'm like, I don't, I don't relate to that. I don't want a boring job. And I don't like to do things that are tedious. I will do it to get the job done for sure. And I will, you know, get it done, but I, I can't stay in that. (laughs) Well, I have a feeling that you're going to have a lot to say when I get to like, what are some of the stereotypes you don't identify with pretty soon? But before we head that direction, um, I'd like to ask you, has there been a growth journey as part of this discovery of your type? Strangely, when I thought I was an INTJ, it did give me like a sense of confidence just like, oh, like this type is really smart. Like, it's okay, Tanya, you're smart. Like, you'll figure it out. And even though I'm not an INTJ, that just was a nice sort of little confidence boost for me. Yeah, with with ISTJ, I mean, for sure, just the like the feelings part, like feelings are very uncomfortable expressing. I might, maybe I know how I feel, but to express it, like that is not at all comfortable for me. And I have like my couple of best friends that I've had for 20 years, like they're super feelers and I'm always, you know, it's, it's, it's hard to relate sometimes. And I feel there's a lot of self-criticism about like, how come I don't have bigger emotions? How come I don't have bigger feelings? Mm-hmm. <laughs> um, and knowing more about ISTJ, it's like, oh, well, cause I do other things, you know, and that's okay. So in my conversations with people, I have noticed that even when somebody it has a different type that ends up being their best fit type as sort of their introduction to the model or earlier on in the the, the stages. Mm-hmm. It was almost like, even though it was the, not the right type, it, it served a purpose. Like for you, mm-hmm. it served a purpose of boosting your confidence. Like, okay, so I'm part of this, you know, like, because INTJs are always described as like mustache twirling geniuses, right? <laughs> And it's like, okay, well, I'm an INTJ, so I can figure this out. And the truth is, it's almost like a Dumbo feather because you are smart and you can figure it out. (laughs) And when you realized you weren't an INTJ, my guess is that all of the uh, watching yourself solve problems and watching yourself overcome obstacles, regardless of why, probably gave you a lot of self-confidence. And so even when you, you know, discovered your best fit type was actually ISTJ, like the INTJ part had served its purpose. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah, completely. So let's get into uh, being an ISTJ. It sounds like it sounds like you take exception to some of these stereotypes. (laughs) So if a person would, you know, were to sit down with you and go, okay, so tell me tell me how it actually is, at least for you. Like, tell me what's going on for you that is very counter to these. You, You mentioned moving a lot and and not feeling tied down to the same old, same old. But can you go a little deeper and talk about how you really experience your functions, like particularly introverted sensing or memory as your dominant or driver function? Yeah, introverted sensing is, it's really, it's really interesting. I mean, it, it basically is, I'm almost sort of like recording like all of my experiences that I have as I have them. And then when I 
am, you know, living my life in, in a, in a situation, I'm sort of pulling from all those experiences, like in real time, you know, unconsciously. <laughs> so, and that's just, the, the sort of the behind the scenes wiring piece where I might not even know how I know something, but I, I, you know, and if, if I, so it's not, and it can, I think it can look like intuition. I think that's what makes it confusing. Cause it's like, is that sounds like it, that would be intuition. Um, but it's a more concrete and sort of experiential sort of learning and knowledge and, and knowing than a sort of lightning beam sort of pulling it in from the universe. <laughs> somehow, which is how I think of introverted intuition. Once I have an experience and sort of learn something, I'm just like always building capacity and sort of a database that I can very like easily reference um, to sort of move forward. And I can, yeah, just kind of keep, keep it going that way. And, and like we talked about in, in the conference that we had together, personality profiling conference, my, my memories are very visually rich. So I can remember like very concrete real life details. It's very, it's very concrete. So I can remember like the way the light was or like the color of something and really, you know, the, the nuance, like the visual nuance. And I'll remember sort of my, my feeling and my orientation toward it, but that's, that's also a piece it's, it's visual. Got it. And so then why you may have mistaken this for introverted intuition and correct me if I'm getting close but not quite on but you because you're recording all of this information throughout your life that doesn't mean you necessarily remember the source you've just seen this before someplace and so Mm -hmm. when you see it again you might not remember where you saw it before but you just feel like you have access to it and it's because Mm -hmm. it's part of this huge Rolodex and so you know you know this thing but because you might not be able to source the original time that you pulled it in, it feels like you just know it. Mm-hmm. Okay. Exactly. Mm-hmm. Tanya, how static or flexible do you find your memory process, your introverted sensing driver? Do you find yourself like when you have an experience, do you calcify? Like, well, that's how that works in the world. And that's just <laughs> like you catalog it and then you just, you never really revisit it. Or is there a, a flexibility to how you capture your experiences and and how do they change over time? Like, how do you experience that from your side? Yeah, I, th- I mean, I think, you know, some of the things are, are calcified and I think it, I think it is healthier to not calcify <laughs> the experiences. I do find myself consciously saying like, well, when I had that experience in the past, it was like this. And then I have to say, but that was 10 years ago. So like, what has changed? <laughs> what could be different? You know, I have to, it, it is a natural initial response, but then I have to kind of dig in a little bit and say, what are all the different components? Um, because surely there's a lot that's different. Yeah. So, so I think it's both. Yeah. So I, I also have this same mental process, except for me, it's a three-year-old process, this memory introverted sensing. Mm-hmm. And I find that for me, it's it can get static or calcified too. Like I will have an experience, maybe when I'm younger, I get sick with a certain illness. Mm-hmm. And every time I think about getting sick, I only remember that experience of it. And I might get sick again recently. And it's not as bad as I remember it being. And I have to almost recalibrate like, oh, like I have this buildup in my head. Like this is way worse than it actually ended up being this time around. And mm-hmm. oh, but over time, I like I built it up in my head. And, and I'm wondering if that's something that doesn't happen for you because you have more sophistication or or is that something that you do still deal with because that's just the process itself? I don't know if it's positional, like because it's an inferior mm-hmm. or three-year-old for me, or if it's just how the function works and you might just have more experience in navigating that space. Yeah, it's, prob- it's probably a little of both. I think that is partially how, how the function works. And then I think trying to have more maturity you know, with it and just sort of question it and, and be, be present with it, <laughs> I yeah. guess. Um, yeah, to make sure that I'm not sort of making decisions like in a closed box or, you know, having the doors closed like I want. I, I, I want the new information and the new experiences because that actually, you know, that's better. So. Yeah. So I'm going to ask him a vulnerable question potentially. How okay. are you experiencing this experience right now? Is it, have you been on podcasts before? Is this something you've done? I have not. No, I have not been on a pod, uh, pod, podcast before. Um, and I mean, so far, this is great. I, I was saying, I think earlier that um, I'm glad it's not being videoed because then I would be <laughs> a little more self-conscious. Sure. <laughs> 
And I just, I just actually had an experience a couple of weeks ago where I was interviewed for a, a work thing and it was a zoom zoom interview. And I was really, really nervous about that. And I was like thinking about the questions and how I was going to answer it and, you know, trying to prep and prepare because I do not want to sound like an idiot. Yeah. <laughs> and I got through that experience. So, I mean, maybe that helped me, you know, build a little capacity for this, but also I feel like in that situation, I didn't have a relationship with the two people that were interviewing me and yeah. that, that makes it a little bit more challenging. Um, and with you, I feel a little bit more comfortable. Um, okay. So, yeah. So you know us. So the reference point you're bringing to this conversation may not be the actual experience of being on a podcast being interviewed, but you can bring the reference of knowing Joel and Antonia to the table. Mm -hmm. And that yeah. maybe helps you like rest into the experience. And you can like, at yeah. least have that as a ballast. Yeah, for sure. I mean, I, you know, I know... I've been listening to your podcast for a long time. So I sort of know how, you know, you are, what you talk about and sort of how, you know, you'll be with guests and um, yeah. So it, so it feels way more comfortable. Yep. I'd like to dip into your relationship with your inferior three-year-old function of extroverted intuition or exploration. And it sounds like, and one of the reasons why we chose you is because we know you to be a seasoned person, right? Like you're a mature person who's got, you know, you've got your life together and you figured some stuff out. And my suspicion is that as you talk about your dominant or driver function of introverted sensing, it's become seasoned because you know the value of variety, of, of trying new things and doing, you know, having some new experiences and then tracking them, like knowing, okay, so this is, this is something I've seen before in the past, but it's 10 years later, so inevitably, th like, components will have changed. And what are those changes? So mm -hmm. uh, so my guess is that you've stretched. You've gotten out of your comfort zone a lot of times. And, um, and, and that's part of why you have such a good relationship with that driver function. Can you, can you talk about some of those experiences or ways that you've stretched? Or I might be wrong. Maybe you haven't. But my guess is that you have. <laughs> Yeah, I mean, um, well, let's take the profiling conference that we did together. I mean, I was like, okay, I'm going for five days to Orlando and I'm going to be with a room full of 30 strangers. <laughs> this could be like very, very difficult. Like I'm, it could be energetically just like exhausting, like having to sort of make those like new relationships, you know, with all of those people. Plus I'm like sitting in a conference room, like a nine to five, which I don't do normally like day to day. So that I feel like is a whole, and I used to like sit in an office. So I, you know, I've, I've done it before. Um, but I was, you know, a bit sort of nervous about like, am I going to be able to stay awake and pay attention <laughs> sitting in a conference room? And then I sort of, you know, coach myself about like, well, you know, everyone's coming from the same you know position. Like nobody knows each other. Everybody is in the same boat. Everyone is just getting to know each other. And, you know, I'm doing this because all the learning and because it's so interesting and all these people have that in common with me. And I sort of think about all the other times, you know, with work situations and that kind of thing where I've had to be in that situation and how I just sort of managed managed through it. You know, I had a great time in the five days. There was not a single moment of like angst or worry or like, oh, this is uncomfortable. Like everyone was fabulous. And I guess because that is a positive experience, it sort of goes in the memory bank <laughs> or down on the ledger as like, yeah, see, that's a good experience. Like do more of that. And that happens. I mean, it happens in so many ways. So like any new situation, my immediate reaction is like, if like, for example, oh, you're invited to just have a dinner with, you know, someone that I know, but there's going to be four or five people that I don't know. I think, oh God, will I have anything in common? Am I going to have to make small talk? Like, you know, how's this going to go? And then if I push myself and be just very, you know, open and, and present, a lot of times, if it's something that I'm dreading, it will be a positive. I mean, granted, there's negative experiences in there, but a lot of times it is positive and it's actually, it's beyond what I think the experience will be. And it's, and it, it sort of, it opens me and, and that just helps me to sort of build that, that strength, I think. Mm, yeah. So like the original or the initial stretching comes with apprehension, but you've had enough great experiences or at least positive ones to encourage more stretching. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. Yep, exactly. And then um, can you weave in a little bit of your relationship to that auxiliary or co-pilot function of extroverted thinking or effectiveness? Like how does how does that help facilitate all of this? Yeah, extra. I love extroverted thinking. <laughs> That's I'm probably if I had to just pick a function that I'm most proud of in my stack, it's it's probably that one because <laughs> I 
because I can just get shit done. I can just like, I can just very easily, it's like sort of running like a triathlon or something, or like, you know, you're like a little track star, like jumping over hurdles or whatever. <laughs> like it's just, it just allows you to easily jump the jumps and whatever, run up the ramps and, you know, and navigate and, and get things done and, and sort of get to the finish line. I can just follow the thread to, I know what the goal is and I can just crush all those <laughs> obstacles to get there. That always, uh, that always feels really good, that function. So what I hear is that extroverted thinking is a source of, I mean, I, I, when you talk about it, I can feel your confidence coming through. <laughs> and so it's like a place of having stretched into that part of who you are. That has been a part, a, a big part of your, um, yourself, your, you know, probably your self-confidence and self-esteem. Do you find that the world helps facilitate that for you? Or do you find that you have to kind of fight for the right to use it? Yeah, well, I think when I was younger, I, I did not use it as much. And I, I think that is part of why I felt a little, I would say, you know, unfulfilled and, and sort of stuck in some ways. Because when I am using it, I, I feel like this is how it should be. You know, like this is, this feels really good. Like I, I want more of this and not just for me, but like in, in the world, like the world, the world um, responds, you know, positively. So, you know, in my career, I use this function all the time. I love it. So it's, yeah, <laughs> but it, I, it wasn't, it wasn't always there. I mean, I, it's only really in the last, I would say like three or four years that it's really bloomed for me and sort of hit like a really good stride in that department. We will be right back. If you're focused on personal growth, I think you'll resonate with our core content over at personalityhacker.com. We want to see you understand how your mind is wired so you can generate motivation, improve social skills, find career opportunities, and master excellent decision making. But a quick warning, we are advice and action focused in all of our articles, podcasts, and videos. This means that we attract people who like to be challenged to become excellent, to take action, to put in the work to optimize themselves, not simply just gather more information. If you are committed to personal growth and ready to radically find your inner truth, then come over and be a part of our growing community of like minds at Personality Hacker. Now back to the show. When you say career, Tanya, you, mm -hmm. you know, somebody might be listening about, well, okay, she's getting stuff done. She's probably like in some kind of business function, you know, running some kind of company or something. But you actually are in the creative side of a career, right? You have a lot of creativity and creative outlets in the way you build your lifestyle and, and your work. Yeah. So I'm a, an interior designer. And um, so I actually help people like navigate the chaos <laughs> that is, you know, renovating a home or building a home or sort of putting a, a room together. And so there are hundreds and hundreds of decisions that you have to make. And within each decision, there are thousands of options and things to know about. And I'm process oriented and, and then so I, so I, I can use my creativity to have the vision, but then it is really satisfying because I, I can make it happen. So I, I navigate all of those decisions. And then, um, you know, it's through relationships that I've built with really talented, you know, tradespeople that actually help me get it done and, and do the work and execute um, the project. I can, you know, sort of clearly sort of outline, you know, these are the steps that we're going to take. And I am constantly learning from what has happened in the past and like what I won't do again. Oh, that I shouldn't work with that person because that person, you know, didn't follow through or made my life more complicated or it was the wrong thing or, you know, whatever the case is, there's a lot of room for error in this field. So always sort of tightening, you know, tightening that and sort of moving it forward and, and getting it, you know, making it easier for me and for my clients. You mentioned before that you have very emotional friends and that you're like, why am I not as tapped into that? Should I be more? But my suspicion is that in interior design, your introverted feeling part of you, like that authenticity 10 year old or tertiary, that probably really helps facilitate a lot of what you do. I'm suspecting. Yeah, for sure. You know, I, this is going to be an introverted sensing comment, but, um, <laughs> you know, <laughs> 
you know, I have like visceral memories of my room from when I was like four years old. Like it was like red shag carpet. And I remember like the orange tweed ottoman that we had in the living room. And, and I don't know, I'm just, I was just born that way, (laughs) but I have always sort of cultivated like a nurturing space for myself. It's always been really important to me. And so from, I think I started when I was in eighth grade and I asked my parents if I could paint my room like vampire red, (laughs) which was a very bold move, but it was the (laughs) nineties. And, you know, was always interested in, um, in art. And I used to collect, you know, just like little inexpensive posters, but like from, you know, the Renaissance and and Baroque era and loved like gold frames. And, you know, through the years, I've always um, looked and appreciated and collected and curated and sort of assembled these nurturing spaces for myself. And that's how it eventually evolved into like doing it for other people. Yeah. And it is, I think, an introverted feeling. Like I, I sort of know like, oh, like, let's, let's put this lighting here because this is how you're going to feel. Um, and this is what's going to be, you know, like nurturing in this particular space. Mm-hmm. I love that phrase, nurturing spaces. What yeah. a great, <laughs> great way to say it. It's mm-hmm. like the space itself is constructed in a way. I'm using constructed deliberately to provide mm-hmm. feelings for people when they enter it. Like that's a... Mm-hmm. What a beautiful way to articulate how your functions are showing up for you. (laughs) Thanks. Yeah. So effectively what you've done, what I hear you saying is that as early as like four years old, you have memories of the environment around you and kind of looking at it going like, is this what I want? (laughs) Is this what's going on? Or that's what I, I I made that pattern leap. But you were talking Mm -hmm. about like remembering the carpet and the ottoman as early as four, just Somebody mentioned um, at one point a phrase about introverted sensing or memory that has just really stuck in my mind. It was an ISFJ. And she said, it kind of feels like Harry Potter's The Wand Chooses the Wizard. Like whatever it ends up being that strikes me and has my whole life, it's like it chose me. I didn't choose it. And it Mm kind of sounds like to me interior design is something that chose you. Yes, for sure. Like I just cannot help myself. (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> and so and and that's just been forever and so it, it's like that you were meant to do this yeah I mean when I was like six going on play dates with my friends I would say oh this is great can I have a tour of your house please <laughs> <laughs> can I see your parents bedroom it must be really nice <laughs> <laughs> that's funny uh, so can I route back to something you had mentioned before though you had mentioned that you weren't always a well, I mean, maybe maybe you did appreciate it, but you weren't always somebody who was using extroverted thinking uh, mm-hmm. to you know to its full capacity. Can you explain a little bit about what your life was like before you really tapped into that part of you? One um, sort of conflict or, or challenge with this personality type is that they they really like stability. And so I struggled, I think, for a while with having stability or sort of um, having, uh, the other parts of my life, I guess, more developed. And so I always, I always for long, for a long time sort of chose stability, which meant that I would like, you know, take these jobs that I would like rationalize, well, the pay is fine. And, you know, it's a stable thing and, um, I'm getting, a, you know, taking care of myself and getting my needs met in all of these ways, which, which, you know, is true, but also not satisfying, you know, long-term. So, I would sort of do that over and over again. And I, I enjoyed the learning of like the new industry and the new position and sort of how all the, you know, the components work together and the people and the departments and those kinds of things, but they never felt creative enough and they never felt, um, I guess like important, um, which, which really goes to my introverted feeling and the authenticity piece. Like, for example, I worked as a recruiter in medical staffing and, you know, was recruiting like physical therapists and occupational therapists and nurses. And like, I don't know anything about the medical world or I'm like grateful that it exists and that the people are, you know, are there and they are saving people and taking care of people. But like, I glaze over (laughs) with boredom. Um, It's just not, you know, not my interest. And so I did it for five years, but I was like sort of dying a little bit inside every day, Mm -hmm. um, feeling like I was sort of, you know, going, going through the motions. Yeah. So it sounds like, it sounds like uh, at that time, really what I'm hearing you say is it was actually getting the relationship between your extroverted thinking 
effectiveness and your introverted feeling authenticity, kind of getting that relationship down um, in a way that served you as an individual better. So like before it was like, I want to feel security. And so I'll go do these, you know, I'll do, I'll, I'll go do these safe jobs, which is that desiring that feeling of security made your co-pilot of extroverted thinking kind of serve that 10 year old of the feeling you were desiring but then you were Mm -hmm. like you know actually I want meaning and impact so what I'm Mm -hmm. going to do is I'm going to have I'm going to actually have my introverted feeling that desire to to you know to do something individual I'm going to actually uh, have it be serving my extroverted thinking like like let's go make the impact we want to make does mm-hmm. that make sense? It's like it's like getting that choreography right. Like uh, I can either just sort of you know chase a feeling that is just that single feeling of safety, or I can really bring who I am into the things that I'm doing in the world. And then and regardless of whatever whatever that is, once you got that dynamic down, once you got that uh, that relationship down, now all of a sudden I, I'm assuming you're not dying inside. I'm assuming you're doing what you love. Yeah, exactly. It's completely, it's a completely transformational experience and completely different. That is a good way to articulate it. Reconciling, like reconciling the, um, the meaning part with all the other, with all the other pieces, like they all have to, they all have to be present. Um, and that is the the special sauce and the magic. Right. Well, and you've got plenty of the extroverted intuition in there too, that exploration, because you can, you can figure all this stuff out, right? Like it's probably <laughs> kind of a new, every client is like a brand new experience, even though you've got a lot to pull on. Mm-hmm. Nothing's going to be like this person wants their space. And so you've got, you also have a lot of creativity in there and a lot of figuring things out. It sounds like all of your functions are just alive in what you're doing. Well, and even just getting to this point, I mean, I cannot tell you how many, how much exploring (laughs) I have done over, you know, over 20 years. Um, I mean, I, I have looked into like so many, you know, schools and degrees and programs and jobs and done, you know, informational interviews with like hundreds of people. And it's, it's served me well in that, in that uh, (laughs) Yeah, what a great advertisement for getting out of your comfort zone. (laughs) It's like, keep doing it. You'll get there eventually. (laughs) Yeah, Yeah, exactly. What do you love about being an ISTJ? I love how, I guess, reliable ISTJs are. I feel like that I'm really proud of that. Like if I give you my word, like it's my word and there's no, well, this is just how I felt on that day. So I said this thing, like it's I'm like incredibly consistent and I I really like that. (laughs) And so if you, uh, I, I asked, uh, we recently interviewed an ESFP and I was like, if you had type envy for who, anybody, who would it be? And so I kind of like this, I, I, I kind of like this question. I've got a, a pattern in my head that I'm wondering will play out if I ask enough people this, but if you had type envy, what type would that be? Huh, I have actually never thought about this. I am not really sure. I mean, maybe it would be, it'd probably be like an an extroverted feeler <laughs> just because it's completely different. Like probably like a, an ENFJ or an ESFJ. Mm-hmm. Yeah. 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 It'd make your life a little easier, right? <laughs> mm-hmm. <laughs> you would think one would think I also have similar type envies. I'm like, I just, I feel like they just have figured about a bunch of stuff out that I have not figured out. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah. Completely. Okay. But let's loop back to where we almost originally started which is all of those stereotypes about being an ISTJ that you just did not resonate with. So if you were going to disabuse people of some of these stereotypes, or just at least personally for you, uh, what are what are some of these descriptions? You mentioned boring or just want to do the same thing every day, but what do people need to know about your type that it seems like is not common knowledge? Uh, well, I would say that they, they definitely are sensitive and have feelings. They just don't... Um they don't wear their feelings, you know, on their sleeve. (laughs) That's because they are more sort of in their head about if I have this feeling, should I articulate it? Like what purpose does it serve? Will I sort of move the needle in any way? Or am I, you know, is it helpful? So there's sort of all of this like inner, I think sort of dialogue and, and questioning that goes on. One thing I think being in the, in the type community, as you guys talk about a lot is, you know, the, the fact that it's um, intuitive, you know, biased and I do. So my two, two of my good friends are both intuitive and I, you know, I do sometimes feel a little shunned. <laughs> like, oh, you're a sensor. 
Um, and so I, I wish that there was sort of more, I guess, information about like sensors and sort of what, what they bring to the table. Yeah. Cause I, I feel a little, sometimes I feel a little like insecure, I, I would say about, about being a sensor, but you know, it just is what it is. So got to go with it. <laughs> what do you think are some great things that sensors bring to the table just generally? I mean, just the super like concrete, like based in reality and sort of like, uh, okay, you know, you can sort of brainstorm out here and, and sort of, you know, ideate, but sort of ha- like, how does that, what's the purpose like down here on planet earth or, you know, right here in this room. Um, so they give it application, which is really important. Yeah. It's so funny because those descriptions, and I, and I'll say this as an intuitive, when I read things like that, I'm like, why is that necessary? But then I recently had a conversation with a sensor and I'm just, I, I, just being in her presence reflected back to me how sloppy I am with the patterns I make. I just throw these ideas out and I'm just like sloppily talking about things. And then all of a sudden I became really self-conscious about this person looking at me being like, um, none of those things are true. And I'm like, you're right. Not a single one. <laughs> Nothing that I just said is at all factual. But it, when I'm surrounded by intuitives, I don't, I'm not, I'm not thinking about that. <laughs> and then mm-hmm. just being around her, her energy reminded me, maybe I just need to be a little more careful about how I'm like throwing these ideas out there and, uh, and the sloppiness of it and, or at least cavalier. And there was just this moment I had of deep appreciation to have that reflected back to me because I'm like, well, you know, I'm in a position where like people listen to what I say. And if I'm throwing out sloppy ideas, you know, just randomly, th- that's not going to have the impact I want at all. And, mm-hmm. uh, and so all of those descriptions where I instinctively go, well, what, what do you need all that stuff for? It's that moment when I'm like, oh, that's, that is exactly what I need. <laughs> that is exactly what, and the, and what, is um, needed to translate some of these, like you said, ideations into something that is more than just, you know, what dies inside your head when you die, if that makes sense. Mm -hmm. One of the things that I love about ISTJs, I think in particular, Tanya, is that you seem to have a really good sense of timing and rhythm and tracking what has happened. Like, I can't tell you how many times I like try to think about a decision I've made like even a month ago and I'm like, why did I make that decision again? And then I'm, I have to almost revisit it over and over again. And mm-hmm. when I'm around somebody like that, that uses memory as a strength, you know, ISTJ, they will often say, well, here's the reason why, because this reason, remember, remember? And I'm like, no, I don't remember. I, I'm not tracking that as much. And, and the sense of timing and kind of knowing when things have to happen and the cadence of that, it feels like magic to me when I watch it because it's just really hard for me to to access. And I think ICJs look at me like, how's that hard? This is so, it's like right here. It's so tangible. So in front of you. Um, do mm-hmm. you, do you resonate with that ability to kind of track things and the timing and rhythm of life? Yeah, I, that, that definitely resonates with me for sure. Mm-hmm. I can, yeah, I can remember maybe like what, what I, yeah, why the, why I came to that conclusion. I can remember, yeah, all the little threads that sort of led up to that and sort of why, you know, I went in this direction. Um, yeah, for sure. And also, I know something that you've talked about a lot on the show is um, extroverted thinking and how, you know, we're a little bit more realistic in terms of like scheduling, like we have a lot of things to get done, but we sort of bake in like more appropriate timetables or timelines to actually sort of get the things done so that it's not like, okay, these 40 things are happening today. And then you can't possibly get those 40 things done. Like you can only do two of them. So pick the two that are the most important and then like feel good about getting those done and then sort of move, you know, move to the next thing. And that definitely resonates with me. Is Tanya calling us out, Joel? (laughs) (laughs) Yeah, like like my experience is I'll schedule a meeting at like two o'clock and I'll schedule a meeting at three o'clock and I'll forget, oh, I need time to like, end the one meeting and start the next one. I didn't make any buffer there. And I'm like, I'm guessing right. that's something you would like intuitively know or just instinctively know, right? Yeah. I would be like, I need 45 minutes in between. I yeah. need to go to the bathroom. I need to get some water. I need to let the dog out. <laughs> yeah, you, have a, you have a sense of this and I don't. Like, I just don't think about all those other elements that probably come very natural to you. So I'm very envious of, of how you're able to just naturally be able to do that. <laughs> So before we conclude, and um, and it's been a great conversation, we're very grateful that you've been with us. What advice would you give to your younger self? You know, there's like an ISTJ, younger ISTJ in the audience who's listening, but let's mm-hmm. let's uh, let's just have you give Tanya great advice 
for like, uh, all right, here's what's coming up and here's what you're going to need to know. I think that that you know fourth position extrovert intuition i think is so critical like keep exploring even though it might feel uncomfortable or like you really have to sort of push yourself to do it um keep exploring to sort of get get that harmony between between the four positions i think as i sort of look back and i and i think well what would i have done differently if i had known you know earlier if i was an istj I think I would have trusted my gut more. Like, I mean, I, I remember, this is a very SI comment too. Like (laughs) I remember having my first job and telling a customer that I was going to, I was really obsessed with interior design. And then I, you know, I wanted to go to school for interior design. And, you know, that was like 20 years ago and it took me like almost 20 years to actually like do it. So I wish that I had done a deeper dive, like in that direction and sort of got it started earlier. Um, but I, I was just working within, you know, what was available to me and what I, you know, saw in my like existing reality. And so it's sort of like, you don't know what you don't know. And, um, you, you have to kind of continue to sort of push the limit and the boundaries and sort of, and move, move forward. (laughs) <laughs> yeah, absolutely. Well, what I hear you saying is you'd have given yourself permission to take risks earlier. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Mm-hmm. And yeah. especially yeah, risks true. that really like, like, you know, that this is right. So just go for it. Yeah, exactly. Instead of staying in like a more safe space position. Yeah. I'll say this to the ICJ listeners. Like, you want me to take risk? Are you out of your mind? You could also, <laughs> you could also maybe say instead of risk, you could also say reference experience push your experimentation to get more reference experiences. You expand the territory of the options available to you, I think is also what I'm hearing you say. Yeah. And have, and have, um, little, little checkpoints and little pillars for yourself. So you don't feel like you just jumped off a cliff and you're now floating in space, (laughs) you know, like, like set, set that up for yourself. So you can take, you can take the risk, you can take the the new challenge, but you're also taking care of yourself in those ways that you that you need that stability and you need those things have to be met as well. So there's a little bit of a dance, I think, and make sure that you are checking in with yourself and, and trying to trying to get those other things met mm. while you're taking those chances. Yeah. So, okay. So then basically it's like honor the fact that you might need a safety net or honor the yeah. fact that mm-hmm. you're like, if you just run rough rough shot that's not going to necessarily work out either yeah you're gonna like make yourself very uncomfortable and and feel probably pretty bad yeah Mm, yeah i guess the way that i said it is very entp right (laughs) give yourself permission (laughs) to take those big risks and just like hang tight (laughs) yeah (laughs) (laughs) honor the self understand that you have specific needs based on your type and honor those while you're stretching yeah 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 for sure tanya I just want to say thank you so much for being on today. This has been fantastic talking with you. My pleasure. I love talking to you all. And thank you so much for all the amazing work that you do and continue to do and have and have done. (laughs) Awesome. Cheers. Really appreciate it. If you've been listening along, you are the fourth person in this conversation. You haven't had a microphone like Antonia, Tanya, and myself, but we still want to hear from you. Come over to personalityhacker.com. Leave a comment, ask a question, or more importantly, Just like Tanya was sharing her personal story, share your personal story. Let us know what's going on for you. If you're an ISTJ, you identify that way and you resonate with some of what Tanya talked about. Maybe there's a question you have of something Tanya raised. You're like, hey, she really made me think about this. What about this thing, guys? We'd love to hear those questions too, but come over and make your voice heard at personalityhacker.com. And if you enjoyed this podcast, you can subscribe to us on iTunes and various Android platforms. If you leave a rating review for us on iTunes, that is, it warms my heart. It helps us out a lot and it warms my heart. I love reading them, so please do so. We have a book. It's called Personality Hacker. If you are at all confused about what we were talking about today with these various cognitive functions or the makeup of an ISTJ, the book is a great reference point. It teaches you how to break down Myers-Briggs types into the various cognitive functions and all those dynamics we were talking about. You know, and Tanya mentioned that uh, she really feels like for an ISTJ, extroverted intuition or exploration is a place you need to stretch, but also honor all your other functions. 
Well, all of that information can be found in the book. So go check it out. You can get it on all major book retailers. Uh, and you can also special order it through your local bookstore, which we encourage you to do. If you leave a rating and review for us on it once you've read it on Amazon or on Goodreads, that also helps us out a lot. And of course, we have an entire suite of programs that are personal growth oriented through the lens of personality type. So if that sounds interesting to you and you want to invest in yourself and your personal growth journey, head over to personalityhacker.com and look at that catalog of programs. My name is Joel Mark Witt. And I'm Antonia Dodge. And we'll talk with you on the next Personality Hacker Podcast. If you're focused on personal growth, I think you'll resonate with our core content over at personalityhacker.com. We want to see you understand how your mind is wired so you can generate motivation, improve social skills, find career opportunities, and master excellent decision making. But a quick warning, we are advice and action focused in all of our articles, podcasts, and videos. This means that we attract people who like to be challenged to become excellent, to take action, to put in the work to optimize themselves, not simply just gather more information. If you are committed to personal growth and ready to radically find your inner truth, then come over and be a part of our growing community of like minds at Personality Hacker.